Hello to our extraordinary Dream City family. I'm here today at our Phoenix Dream Center with our director of our Dream Center, Brian Steele. And Brian, we are standing today in an amazing place. What is this place? This is the Halle Healing Center at the Phoenix Dream Center. And as we started our human trafficking program a number of years ago, we found that 30% of the girls coming to us were pregnant. And so trying to have that, that conversation with them about what, what could life look like for the, for the baby, um, but also uh, something that we can do in-house for their medical needs, not having to take them all over campus. It helped them to feel really good about being here, getting the medical care here. It's so cool. This place, the Dream Center, is all about life, valuing life, trying to help people live a better life. And we recently now have just acquired a brand new ministry. Talk about that. We did. We did. So this is a ministry that comes along teenage girls who find themselves pregnant. And the youngest that we've ever seen is nine years old, if you can believe that. Some of the girls, are, many of them are in their early teens, but most of them are around 14, 15 years old. And these are girls who happen to be pregnant and what's next? What are the options? If you look to the, the news and the media and the different things, there's a pretty clear option. Um, but there are other options. There's an option for life. There's an option for carrying that baby going full term. And so our pregnancy resource clinic um, gives a free ultrasound to the girls, explains the options, talks about gestation and what's going on with the little baby. And most importantly, I think, um, it, 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 they hear the heartbeat. And when they hear the heartbeat of that baby, it's a, it's a whole different decision. That's so cool. Well, uh, if you're uh, wanting more information about how you can be involved in this pregnancy uh, clinic to help prevent uh, abortions and things like that in our community, stop in the lobby on the way out because uh, we're doing great things to help young ladies. Brian, thank you so much thank for you, being here today and come along with us as we uh, talk today about rethinking life. Hey, I want to give a special shout out to all of our campuses. Those of you who are joining us up in the White Mountains, how y'all doing? Those of us up, up in Colorado City, at the Phoenix campus, the Glendale campus, the Scottsdale campus, we love you all. And today I'm here down at the Phoenix Dream Center in their medical clinic. I've been walking around this place and this is one amazing place. This whole Dream Center facility is teeming with life spiritual growth, physical life, people just recovering from every imaginable way of life. And it's so cool to be here today. I love life. The older I get, the more I find myself celebrating the gift and the treasure of life. You know, the fact that you're alive is a gift. Now, you may not be too excited about the car you're currently driving or the home or apartment you're living in, but you're alive. And that's an incredible gift from God. So turn the person next to you right now, take five seconds, and just say, it's good to be alive. Come on, do it right now. It's good to be alive. You see, the older I get, the more in awe I am of verses like Genesis 2 and verse 7, which says, The Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. You see, God is the author of life. Men can't make it. Uh, scientists can't engineer it. And once it's gone, nobody can recreate it. It's a gift from God, and it ought to be celebrated. On the other hand, the older I get, the more I hate death. Man, I resent its selection process and terrible timing. I, I get so frustrated when a man or woman callously usurps God's domain and takes someone else's life. I mean, take their car, but don't take their life. They're dead without it. And not only do I hate death, I hate death's father. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. You see, death is Satan's deal. But Jesus said, my purpose is to give life in all its fullness. God is the author and engineer of life. Satan is the author and engineer of death. Which is why the Apostle Paul refers to death as the enemy. Because death stands in direct opposition to the very nature of who God is. He's the life giver. Which is why God promises in His Word that when He closes the curtain on history as we know it, He will gather all His followers to Himself to be with Him forever in heaven. Where He says there will be no more death. No more walking around with that gnawing awareness that the clock is ticking and that time is growing short. 
No more bodies wearing out. No more loved ones disappearing, leaving gaping holes in our hearts. God promises us no more death, just eternal life with the life giver. Wow. I think at some level, we all value life. That's why doctors take pledges to sustain it. Soldiers train to protect it. Artists perform to enhance it. Ministers preach Christ to redeem it because intuitively, we all know that life is valuable. We know that life is a gift. And that is why we have developed labels for societies that appropriately value life and labels for those societies that devalue life. And so we appropriately call societies that tolerate violence and cruelty and the wholesale slaughter of human beings barbaric or uncivilized. And we call those societies that treat their citizens with dignity and strongly protect and value life civilized societies. So here's my question. As we look at what is currently going on in our nation, are we heading in the direction of becoming more civilized or are we heading in the direction of becoming less civilized? With regard to how we're treating each other these days from conception to the grave, are we showing signs of attaching more value to life or less value? Are we doing a better job of protecting the weak and the vulnerable among us or a worse job? Well, friends, all you got to do is read the data. You see that crimes against children, women, minorities, the aged, and the handicaps are on on the rise. Our progress towards civility has long stalled out And nowhere is this more evident than in the category that score keeps what we're doing with unwanted pregnancies. In case you haven't heard, we're not doing a very good job of celebrating when a little baby is granted this wonderful gift of life. You see, whenever the gift of life is bestowed on a developing little baby, there ought to be some high fives going around. There ought to be some jumping up and down, people running around saying, I value my gift of life and I celebrate yours. But that's not how it's happening for nearly 500,000 babies each year. And not only are these babies not being celebrated, we're not even doing a very good job of protecting these developing babies from mistreatment and violence. You see, an alarming percentage of all pregnancies these days are victims of a rather severe form of in-womb child abuse. Not as many names like abortion or termination, but it's really in-womb child abuse of the worst kind. Now, on a side note, I am so grateful that over the past 25 years, we have finally addressed the horrors of child abuse. These days, we have served notice to any adult, if you abuse a child or infant, you're going to be held accountable for your actions. You're going to be arrested and convicted and put in jail for a long, long time, as it should be in a civilized society. But in the strangest twist of human logic, if you take an infant and you push the reverse button on the video of his or her life and you roll that infant's life story back a few frames so it's just a few inches inside the birth canal, that infant can be legally hacked up, poisoned, sucked to pieces, and thrown into a dumpster. And you know what many of us do even though we know that's taking place every day in our country? We just look away. We just go to work and go home. We go to church and go home. And then when we get bored, we watch another movie on Netflix and we just get on with our life. I mean, I wonder how many of us are really all worked up about abortion. Speaking of movies, I watched a movie just a few months ago made by Pure Flix, which I applaud Pure Flix for all the great movies they're producing, wholesome movies. The movie was called Unplanned and it graphically depicted what happens to babies when they are terminated how they are sucked apart limb by limb, how their head is crushed so it can be removed from the womb without undue pain to the mother, how the abortion attendant then inventories the body parts on a nearby countertop to make sure all the pieces are there and accounted for, and then how the attendant casually flips a switch on the wall for the extra horsepower garbage disposal that will take care of everything else. See, these are little babies that had they been born prematurely would have been just fine. They could have gone home that day and laid in a crib in your house or mine. But because of this strange twist in human logic, because they're just a few inches inside the birth canal instead of a few inches outside the birth canal, it's unthinkable what happens to those little infants. 
I was thinking, I wonder what would happen if I showed that movie at your church location today. I, I can al already hear the screams of protests and the emails accusing me of shock values. Poor taste, Luke. We know that goes on every day in abortion clinics nearby our homes, but this is a church. Let's just talk and sing about the love of Christ. Let's, let's just forget about that and talk about the grace of God. Well, you can relax. I'm not going to show the movie today. But I am going to state to you as clearly as I can four reasons why abortion is an unacceptable solution to the problem of one, unwanted pregnancies. I want to give you four reasons why I think we all need to rethink this area of life. Here's the first reason. The first reason is what I'll call, I call the bioethical reason. Now listen carefully. Since the 1973 Roe v. Wade Supreme Court decision, women have been filing in, in and out of abortion clinics in order to remove what has been referred to as those little spots or lumps of worthless tissue. And everything was going just fine for about 15 years until the invention of ultrasound and the advances in fetology. Suddenly, when a woman went into their doctor's office to check out their pregnancies, a little probe was put on their stomach. And they looked at a little video monitor and they could see that it was not just a lifeless lump of tissue in there. But at nine weeks or 11 weeks, they could see a little baby with little arms and little legs and a, a little head and a heart beating. A little human being in there with a desire to do backflips in there, whether their mother liked it or not, you know? When ultrasound came of age, it was a serious blow to the pro-abortion crowd. Because no longer could the lab workers and technicians and doctors say, we'll just take away the little spot. It was more than a spot in there. It was a human life. About that time, the world-renowned French uh, geneticist Jerome Lehune went on record as saying this, to accept the fact that after fertilization has taken place, a new human life has come into being, is no longer a matter of taste or opinion. What was he saying? He was saying, as scientists, we don't even debate anymore when life begins. It happens at the point of conception. Another doctor named Jaime Gordon writes this, the question of when life begins is no longer a question for the theological or philosophical dispute. It is an established fact. Life begins at the moment of conception. Friends, listen, all the research is complete on this issue. The biochemist, the geneticist, and the phytologist uh, um, are all in agreement on this. Human life begins at the moment of conception. That's a scientific fact. It's unarguable. Now, this kind of presents an ethical problem of whether to call the termination of a human life inside the womb something different than we call the termination of a life outside the womb. Because outside the womb, we call the ending of human life killing, or murder, or homicide. So what then should we call the termination of life when it happens inside the womb? Can, can you see the ethical problem here? If a fully alive human being is a few inches inside the birth canal, then doctors can legally collect a handsome fee for snuffing out its life. And then the abortion doctor can go to the movies that night and eat popcorn. However, if the fully alive baby is a few inches outside the birth canal and someone snuffs out its life, there's moral outrage. Lock that guy up and throw away the key. It seems to me that the geographic position of a baby with respect to the birth canal is a pretty critical factor, don't you think? I mean, if you're a baby in the womb right now, you probably ought to do a little less thumb sucking and a little more strategic thinking about how you're going to get yourself outside of that womb. I mean, if I were in there, I'd be saying, I want out of here. I'm fair game when I'm inside of here. One doctor described his dilemma this way, a dilemma that's happening in his hospital. He says, you know, it's a real problem. On one floor of the hospital, we specialize in keeping premature deliver babies alive. Little tykes about six, 16 or 20 weeks along that we can hold in the palm of our hands. We can do wonders with these little babies. We can nurse them back to full health and they can live full lives. But one floor below that, we do abortions on babies much further developed than the ones we're helping to save upstairs. It gets a little confusing to the hospital staff. You wouldn't want to press the wrong button on the elevator, would you? So friends, my first main reason 
why we need to rethink abortion is because bioethically, the practice of abortion is indefensible. It's the killing of a fully alive human being who just so happens to be on the wrong side of the birth canal. And by the way, all the rhetoric, rhetoric we hear these days about a mother's rights over her own body sound a little hollow when you start to understand that there is a fully alive human baby developing in the womb of that mother. And if you really do believe in the individual rights of all human beings, then you have to admit there's two individual rights that must be taken into consideration. The baby's rights, as well as the mother's rights. But you know the way our current laws read, the baby has no rights at all. They don't exist on one side of the birth canal, but they exist in full just inches away on the other side of the birth canal. So again, I would say to any womb-bound babies right now who can hear my voice, get out of there as fast as you can. It's a lot safer for babies outside of the birth canal. I have a second reason why I believe abortion is an unacceptable way of handling unwanted pregnancies. And this is the psychological reason. Simply put, mothers that abort their babies wind up with deep regrets and gaping emotional wounds, some of which never ever seem to heal. Now, admittedly, not all women. Planned Parenthood and other pro-choice organizations will tell you that there are certain women who can go in and get an abortion. Then a couple of years later, go out and get a second abortion, and then a third abor abortion, then a fourth abortion, and it doesn't seem to phase them at all. I hear there are women around like that. But you know, I've been a pastor for 26 years, and I've talked to dozens of women who have had abortions. I've never met a single one who didn't deeply regret it. Luck of the draw? What do you think? I mean, maybe the next 15 women I bump into are going to say, you know, I had one. It was like going to the dry cleaner to get a spot removed. No problem at all. But I really doubt it. When I announced I'd be speaking on, about rethinking life, I started receiving emails and letters from women at Dream City who've had abortions. They would say things like this, Luke, please tell pregnant women who are trying to make up their minds about whether or not to keep or abort their babies, please tell them to call me. Here's my contact information. I promise I won't preach at them. I won't judge them or shame them. I just want to tell them my story and show them my wounds that I carry in my heart. And after that, it's, it's their choice. One woman wrote to me about her aborted son. She writes to her aborted son a letter. Dear, dearest Gabriel, my unborn son, I'm sorry for what I did. I'm sorry that mommy didn't have the courage to have you. I'm sorry that you trusted me and I failed you. She goes on to talk about for 16 years how she lived with the trauma, the psychological trauma of her decision. I think about you often, she says, and always daydream about you. I love you with all my heart. Save a place for me in heaven. I look forward to meeting you. One female columnist wrote about how abortion does far more soul damage to a woman than a woman being raped even. She said, at least somewhere in the trauma and the tragedy of a rape episode, a woman finds a sliver of solace in knowing that, it, that this was not her choice, but not so with the abortion trauma. In fact, the peace that usually won't go away is the knowledge that there was indeed another choice, not an easy choice, not a low cost alternative. Carrying a baby to full term, you know, risking losing the job, the financial implications, the social embarrassment, the separation and pain once you give the child up for adoption, if that's your choice. But still, there is another option. And this woman writer says that the second option is going to lead to far less soul damage than the abortion ever will. So I have a bioethical reason. I have a psychological reason for not having abortions. Number three, I also have a medical reason. Another letter from a woman here at Dream City goes this way. I had an abortion when I was 16 years old, and I have regretted it every day of my life. When I see mothers with their children at church, I, I'm so happy for them. But there's also the sadness in my heart of knowing that I will never be able to have a child of my own due to my abortion. My abortion left me unable to have children. I, I took a life, but I thank God for healing, for the healing I have found today. God is using me as a leader in our post-abortion group here at Dream City Church. 
Now friends, I could spout off stats that show dramatic increases in the risk of infertility and miscarriages and premature deliveries, you know, for, for women who've had these abortions, but maybe hearing about the medical risk associated with abortion from a woman who actually owned and operated abortion clinics might bring more credibility to my concern. See, for many years, Carol Everett owned and directed abortion clinics. She became very wealthy in the process. You do know that money drives this whole thing. It's money and greed that fuels the entire abortion industry. And while Carol Everett became very wealthy owning and directing her abortion clinics, she, was also, she became also disillusioned, primarily because of all the medical damage that was being done to these women who were getting abortions. And her disillusion led her to do some soul searching, which led her to the cross of Jesus Christ, where she gave her life to Jesus. She got out of the abortion business and she wrote this book called Blood Money, in which she lifts the secret veil off what goes on in the abortion clinics around the country and of how many medical complications actually occur in the business. I would encourage you to buy the book and, man, fasten your seatbelt because it is information you will never, ever hear from Planned Parenthood or the pro-choice folks. Well, lastly, I have a biblical reason. Now, granted, there is no verse in the Bible that says, thou shalt not have an abortion. But there are scores of passages in the Bible that tell us to celebrate and affirm and protect the gift of life. Jesus, again, said in John 10, 10, I've come to give you life in all of its fullness. He said, I'm all about life. I'm all about the quality of life. I'm all about eternal life. I'm a life-affirming Savior, Jesus said. In fact, God is so pro-life and so pro-quality of life that He's given us all kinds of scriptures in the Bible telling us that life is so precious and that we ought to treat it so carefully that we shouldn't even strike each other which would diminish the quality of life. We shouldn't even speak harshly to one another. God says, don't take the shine off this wonderful gift of life by hitting each other or speaking unkindly to each other. The sixth commandment says it about as clearly as can be said. Exodus 20 and verse 3, Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not trespass in, into the domain where God alone decides you know, when he's going to spawn life and when he's going to number someone's days and say, that's enough. That's God's exclusive territory. Then there's this major theme that runs all throughout the Bible of God having a heart to protect the afflicted and the helpless and the vulnerable and those who have no power or voice. And God commands us to do the same thing. Make no mistake about it. When Jesus said, I notice when a single sparrow falls from the sky, That same Jesus also notices and cares when a freshly conceived baby miraculously developing in the safety of its mother's womb is suddenly subjected to a nightmarish attack that ends its life before it sees a single smile or a sunrise. So that's my biblical concern. The Bible clearly says, thou shall not kill. So... Those are the four reasons why I think abortion is a totally unacceptable solution to the problem of unwanted pregnancies. And I'm asking you to rethink these topics, the bioethical reason, the psychological reason, the medical reason, and the biblical reason. Now, I wanna close this message by giving a few challenges to every person hearing my voice today. Here's the first challenge. I wanna challenge you to rethink life. I want to challenge you to come to your own well-informed conviction on this issue of life and death. I mean, it's so easy to hear the sound bites on the evening news and read the bumper stickers and billboards and just climb on the bandwagon with one group or another without ever having done authentic reflection or deep personal soul searching. That's a very low integrity approach to establishing a conviction on this issue. I know some of you came here today with a pro-choice or pro-abortion position. I'm glad you're here. We welcome you here. We hope you make this your family. But my question to you is this, why do you hold that position? Do you know why you hold it? Could you defend that position? Could you defend it against the bioethical reason not to have an abortion? Or the psychological reason? Or the medical reason? Or the biblical reason? Have you done your homework on this issue? Really? Or have you just climbed on the bandwagon with a group you thought was right? 
without really thinking deeply about it, you know, at a soul level. I hope you will do that because the stakes are really high, not just for mothers, but also for babies. Others of you came here today as pro-lifers. You know the slogans and the rhetoric, but have you really done your homework? Would you be able to give a compelling defense of your position if asked to? You really need to do that. We've all got to do our homework on this, friends. So I would encourage you to stop at the table in the lobby before you leave. Pick up some resources, read up on this issue, and make your conviction your conviction on this matter. Here's my second challenge. I challenge you to take action with integrity. Action with integrity. I mean, we've all seen the past years how some Bible-carrying pro-life activists have crossed the line of integrity that has discredited the God that we worship. Like the so-called Christian who gunned down the abortion doctor while he was in church a few years ago. How does that moral map work? I'm a pro-lifer, therefore I will end your life? I mean, how does that moral map work? It doesn't. It's an outrage. And it's not the way of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 3, 9 says, Never, ever return evil for evil. Evil, never. Ephesians 4, 26 says, Be angry. There ought to be some outrage in your spirit about, about what you're hearing here today, some of this stuff. But Scripture says, Be angry, but do not sin in your anger. So to those of you who want to honor the gift and, and the wonder and the miracle of life and stand up for the rights of the unborn, do it with all your heart. Do it as unto the Lord. Write letters, picket, vote, march. Align yourself to serve in organizations that exist for this purpose. But remember to reflect the kindness of Jesus Christ. And remember that the people standing on the other side of the street, those on the other side of the issue still matter to God. He loves them too. And he wants to reach them. Here's my final challenge. I just want to say a few words, really hopeful, encouraging words to those among us who have had abortions. Or maybe you have paid for someone to have an abortion. Or you've counseled someone to have an abortion. Some of you knew that I was going to be talking about this subject today. And I can't even imagine how you've endured sitting through this message. I can only commend your courage for having come today and, and listened to this message. And I've read many of your soul-wrenching letters and emails. And I've wept with some of you around these altars. And I feel like I have to remind you today of the words of God through the prophet Isaiah, who said in Isaiah 118, though your sins be as scarlet, they can be as white as snow. Though they be red as crimson, they can be made as wool. Can you take in those words today? Can you breathe those words into your spirit? I just want to remind all of you who are sitting in this church today what kind of church we are. At Dream City, we are just a colossal collection of moral fallops. That's all we are. All of us. All of us could sit around a moral po poker table tonight and just hold our cards. And someone would lay a card down and say, here's my mistake. And somebody else would say, I, I see that one and I raise you on this one and show you their mistake. And somebody else would say, you think that's something, watch this. And they would lay down another card that would trump that mistake. And on and on we would go about the mistakes and the fallops in our life. I mean, if we were to play a moral poker and we all started laying down our cards on the table, everyone in this place would stand exposed. Because all we are, we're sinners. And some of our moral fallops are just as serious as your fallop when you terminated your pregnancy. You see, we're in this thing together, friends. We're in this together. And God would say to all of us together right now, I want you all to lay your cards on the table. I want you to expose your moral failures to the light of my holiness. And then turn to a blood-stained cross and say, on the basis of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, I'm going to look to Christ to make my scarlet sins as white as snow. Next weekend, we're going to be baptizing people at every campus. And we're going to have a big cross at the base of that pool before you enter, where people can write their worst sins down on a piece of paper, and before they get baptized, just pin them to the cross. That's what you've got to do with your mistakes that you've made, especially in this area of your life. You gotta take them and pin them to the cross and say, I bear it no more. 
Christ bore the penalty and he paid the price for that sin. Then you got to get up and walk out of here in the fullness of life, liberated to live a new life in Jesus Christ in anticipation of eternal life with Christ. God, the author and engineer of life, wants us to live our lives that way. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I pray in this moment that you would pour out your big bucket of grace all across the people at all of our campuses. I pray that right now people would turn their hearts to you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you for watching this message today. I believe that right now as you're watching this video, God is speaking to your heart. God is speaking to you about a new life, a new future, a new hope. The Bible says that the way we connect with God is we actually call upon the name of the Lord. The Bible says, he who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's almost like taking your cell phone out and making a call to somebody that you really love. You're making the call. And I wanna encourage you to make the call to God today. And as you do, he promises to forgive your sins, to adopt you into his family, and to give you a hope and a future. So today, if you are ready to call upon the name of the Lord, would you just close your eyes right now and just sincerely say these words to God. Dear Heavenly Father, just say those words. I ask you today to be the leader of my life. I ask you to forgive me for my sins and adopt me into your family. I want to be a Christian. I want to follow Jesus. So I give you my heart today. Thank you for hearing my prayer. Thank you for forgiving me. In Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says if you prayed that prayer, He heard you and He forgave you. So I want to say to you, welcome to the family of God. Go find a great church to be involved in. If you don't have one, come join us here at Dream City and we'll help you live out the Christian faith and grow closer to Jesus. God bless you all.